Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And this week and next week I'm going to be trying out something a bit new for this channel, as in I want to do a two-parter video. I've for a long time wanted to talk about Shakespeare's sonnets, in particular the candidates who have been suggested as potential recipients for those sonnets, but there's a lot of material to cover and so I thought it best to divide the work up into two parts. So in this first video I'm going to be looking at the earlier sonnets, the ones that are said to be addressed to the in quotes fair youth, and then next week, next Friday, I'm going to upload the second part which looks at the later sonnets which are believed to be addressed to the in quotes dark lady. So if you're not already subscribed to this channel, now will be the time to do so and also to click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. Because I do hope that you're going to enjoy this video and also stick around for next week's video and enjoy that one too. But for now, let's get into this first video where I'm going to be looking at the first set of Shakespeare's sonnets that are thought to be addressed to the fair youth. The sonnet form found its way into early modern England in the early 16th century. From its arrival, it was the beloved poetic form of a number of leading poets, many of whom also had ties to the English royal court. Among their number was Thomas Wyatt, Edmund Spencer, Philip Sidney and Henry Howard, who was the Earl of Surrey. Clearly, William Shakespeare was inspired by this elite court art form and he determined to create his own. And create his own he certainly did. By 1609, he had produced at least 154 sonnets. And we know this because 1609 is the year that Thomas Thorpe gathers them together in a collection for publication. Academics are still unable to agree whether Thorpe had Shakespeare's input or even permission when it came to creating and collating this volume. There is also debate about when these sonnets were actually written in the first place. And in lieu of any academic consensus, a relatively safe bracket of time is between 1591 and 1604 for their creation. The sonnets may all have been written in a couple of months during this period, or they could have been written across the whole span. We're just not sure. Where there is at least some consensus among Shakespeare scholars is the fact that within this sequence of sonnets, there appears to be two people to whom the various sonnets are being addressed to. In the earlier sonnets, they are seen to be addressed to a fair youth, as I mentioned earlier, while in the later, they are being addressed, we think, to a dark lady. In the fair youth sonnets, the first 17 sonnets are also then divided up again. These first 17 are called the procreation sonnets, where the author attempts to inspire his young friend, his fair youth, to go forth and multiply, so that his beauty may be enjoyed for generations. At sonnet 18, there is a shift, a fulcrum turn, and we seem to see the poet falling in love with his subject. Sonnets 19 up to 126 are then seemingly charting the relationship between these two men, the poet and his fair youth. Now I have no intention to read out the full 126 sonnets from this first part of the sequence, because frankly we'll be here for hours, but I have chosen a select few sonnets that I do want to look at with you. I think that they're really interesting and I think that they highlight this shifting relationship as we go from procreation sonnet to falling in love to the relationship, potentially platonic but potentially physical and sexual, between the poet and his fair youth. And I want to see what you think of this relationship and what's being charted. So when you see things that are interesting to you, please do pop them in the comments section down below. But for now, let's look at the sonnets I've chosen. Sonnet 1. From fairest creatures we desire increase, that thereby beauty's rose might never die. But as the riper should by time decease, his tender air might bear his memory. But thou, contract to thine own bright eyes, feeds thy light's flame with self-substantial fuel, making a famine where abundance lies. Thyself thy foe, to thy sweet self too cruel, Thou that art now the world's fresh ornament and only herald to the gaudy spring, within thine own bud buriest thy content, and, tender churl, makest waste in niggarding. Pity the world, 
or else this glutton be, to eat the world's Jew by the grave and thee. This sonnet is not only the first sonnet in the whole sequence, it is also the first in the sequence known as the Fair Youth Sonnets. On top of that, the first 17 of these are more commonly known as the Procreation Sonnets. This sonnet and the first 17, indeed, are the writer informing his subject of the moral responsibility he has to reproduce. He counsels him against being vain, self-indulgent and selfish. This young, fair man may think he does not want to find himself burdened with a wife or children. The poet counsels against this. It is important for the world that he reproduce himself. The world deserves that his beauty be not only a memory, but also be memorialised in any heirs that he may have. Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Sonnet 18 is arguably one of the most famous and oft-quoted sonnets that Shakespeare wrote. It comes directly after the sequence known as the procreation sonnets. Sonnet 18 is the first in the sequence to not specifically encourage and in fact demand that the subject of the sonnet engage in procreation. People have seen this sonnet, Sonnet 18, as the fulcrum of the sequence, that at this point the poet falls in love with the subject he is addressing, that arguably William Shakespeare falls in love with his fair youth. Sonnet 20. A woman's face with nature's own hand painted. Hast thou, the master mistress of my passion, a woman's gentle heart, but not acquainted with shifting change as is false women's fashion? an eye more bright than theirs, less false in rolling, gilding the object whereupon it gazeth, a man in hue, all hues in his controlling, much steals men's eyes and women's souls amazeth, and for a woman wert thou first created, till nature, as she wrought thee fell a-doting, and by addition me of thee defeated, by adding one thing to my purpose nothing. But since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use their treasure. Sonnet 20 has been heavily debated by academics, and continues to be so. In addressing this clearly male subject, who also seems to be androgynous, at least to Shakespeare's mind, he is both master and mistress, and in control of Shakespeare's passion, Academics query whether this is proof of Shakespeare's homosexuality, despite the fact that no such word existed in Shakespeare's time. The last five lines of this sonnet have been pored over by multiple academics, as they try to decipher and discover whether, in this sonnet, Shakespeare is announcing that he has had a physical relationship with his fair youth, or that he wants to, or that he's thought about it. In those lines, and for a woman thou wert first created, Till nature as she wrought thee fell a-doting, and by addition me of thee defeated. The poet is here announcing that he believes his fair youth should have been born a woman, but nature made a mistake, and made him male, and in doing so, added something to his person that then meant Shakespeare could not have him, that Shakespeare was defeated in his love for him. Nature has added one thing to my purpose nothing, the poet is here euphemistically referring to the fair youth genitalia. Further, the poet concludes, But since she pricked thee out for woman's pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use their treasure. The poet is here saying that since you must reproduce with women, then they can have you for that use. The poet will keep the main part of his love, the thing of most value. The question remains, 
does the main part of that love involve physical sexual intimacy or is it purely platonic and emotional? I'd love to know what you think in the comment section down below. Sonnet 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state and trouble death heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising happily, I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising from sullen earth, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. In Sonnet 29, the distressed and hopeless poet finds relief from his suffering in thinking of his beloved. For those seeking to work up a biography of Shakespeare, they have looked to his plays and, of course, his sonnets and poems to find evidence for the man, how he lived, how he thought and what was going on. And this is particularly true in the case of Sonnet 29. Some biographers have attempted to assert that this particular sonnet was written in 1592. And if that is the case, then they believe they have found some reason for the distress that is expressed in this sonnet. If this sonnet was written in 1592, then the poet's distress might be explained by the fact that all of the theatres had been closed on account of plague, and or that he had been the victim of a scathing deathbed attack launched by Robert Greene. Sonnet 73. That time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. Bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset fadeth in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, death's second self, that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire, that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that with which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong, to love that well which thou must leave ere long. In Sonnet 73, the poet is marking out the discrepancy in ages between himself and his subject, the fair youth. The fair youth sonnet sequence, it seems, is not being written based upon a memory. The poet is writing in real time, people allege, to somebody who is significantly younger than him. When people attempt to find the identity of the fair youth, this is one of the poems that is used as evidence that he must have been considerably younger than Shakespeare was, if indeed it was Shakespeare writing to somebody that he knew who was at the time a fair youth. Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no. It is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool. Though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come, love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Much like Sonnet 18, Sonnet 116 is another incredibly famous and oft-quoted sonnet within the sequence. Within the first line, where the poet says, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, this has been read as an exploration of the Renaissance idea of love, and most specifically, its way of seeking out the idea of a perfect form of love. The Renaissance thinkers and philosophers, looking back to the ancient world for inspiration, looked on love as something that could be defined and sought out in perfection. 
It is also worth pointing out that for some Renaissance philosophers and thinkers, this idea of perfect love was something that could only exist between men. Due to their belief in the humoral model of science and medicine, which saw women as being imperfect men, improperly heated in their mother's wombs, making them cold and wet, whereas men were the perfect form of humanity, properly cooked by their mothers and therefore hot and dry. Thus, a perfect love can only exist between two perfect specimens. Women are imperfect, so two women can't have perfect love, and men and women are different in their perfections, men being perfect, women being imperfect. Therefore, love between the two, while it can be generative, is not perfect. Instead, for some in the early modern or Renaissance world, perfect love had to exist between two men. The question then becomes, was it ever acceptable for this perfect love to find physical expression? According to church law, the answer would have been no. Such physical relationships would have represented the crime of sodomy. I wonder what you read in Sonnet 116. Do you see a poet arguing for the necessity of a physical relationship for this perfect love? Is he justifying it? Or do you think he is simply saying that the perfect love exists between men and it is a platonic one? Do let me know in the comments section down below. When Thomas Thorpe publishes the collection of William Shakespeare's sonnets, he does so with this frontispiece. As you can see, this collection has been dedicated to Mr WH. The identity of Miss WH has been the source of speculation and, frankly, outright argument for centuries. Is he also William Shakespeare's fair youth? Bertrand Russell and Jonathan Bates certainly don't think so. Instead, they suggest that WH was a printing error for WS and that what Thomas Thorpe is doing is dedicating the volume to the person who's actually the author, to William Shakespeare. But what if Russell and Bates are incorrect and Mr WH is not a misprinting for Mr WS, William Shakespeare? What if WH refers to another person? And what if that person is in fact Shakespeare's fair youth? Well then, who is WH in that context? Who are the potential candidates? William Herbert, born in 1580, was 16 years Shakespeare's junior. He was destined to become the third Earl of Pembroke, a veritable flower of the nobility. As he approached adulthood and his legal majority, there was talk that he seemed to be unwilling to marry. In fact, he wouldn't marry until 1604, when he would have been in his 24th year, when he marries Lady Mary Talbot. Now, if we are prepared to agree that the sonnets were written between 1591 and 1604, then those first 17 so-called procreation sonnets could feasibly be addressed to William Herbert. As before 1604, William Herbert seems to have been behaving in just the sorts of ways that the poet is counselling against in those first 17 sonnets. Historically, William Herbert's sexuality is also somewhat ambiguous. His closeness with James I of England, 6th of Scotland, drew comment, most conspicuously from the Venetian ambassador at James's English coronation. What is certain is that William Herbert was a patron of the arts. William Shakespeare's posthumous first folio, published by Heming and Condell in 1623, was dedicated to William Herbert and his brother Philip. He also had links to other men from the professional playhouses, people that Shakespeare was certainly in contact with, Richard Burbage and Edward Alleyne. If we invert Mr WH to HW, then we are perhaps presented with another candidate for the fair youth, Henry Risley. He would go on to become the third Earl of Southampton, and he was Shakespeare's patron from probably 1593 to 1594. Henry Risley was some seven years older than William Herbert, being born in 1573, which still, of course, makes him younger than William Shakespeare. Like William Herbert, Risley also seemed keen to avoid getting married. William Cecil, Lord Burley, it seems, was keen to marry Henry Risley off to his granddaughter, Lady Elizabeth Vere. Risley seems to have been less keen. Perhaps, though, Lady Elizabeth Vere wasn't to his taste, because he did marry in secret in 1598 to Elizabeth Vernon. Perhaps, though, one of the key reasons why Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton, is put forward as a candidate to be the fair youth is because of the way he presents himself. 
particularly in his portraits. He was known to be incredibly keen on fashion and ornamentation, and we see him here with his hair flowing about his shoulders. He has a beautiful, almost feminine face. He is very much the sort of person who could be called a master mistress of someone's passion. Additional weight for Risley being the actual focus of the Fair Youth sonnet is also found in the fact that William Shakespeare dedicates two poems to him. He dedicates Venus and Adonis and also The Rape of Lucrece. The dedication to The Rape of Lucrece is seen as being particularly telling. It is addressed to the Right Honourable Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton and Baron of Titchfield. The love I dedicate to your lordship is without end whereof this pamphlet, without beginning, is but a superfluous moiety. The warrant I have of your honourable disposition, not the worth of my untutored lines, makes it assured of acceptance. What I have done is yours. What I have to do is yours. Being part in all I have, devoted yours. Were my worth greater, my duty would show greater. Meantime, as it is, it is bound to your lordship to whom I wish long life, still lengthened with all happiness. Your Lordship's in all duty, William Shakespeare. So in Henry Risley, we have a young man who chooses to have himself painted in a fairly androgynous and maybe effeminate way. He is also the recipient of this fine dedication by William Shakespeare. It seems incredibly loving. However, many academics maintain the argument that this type of effusive language is par for the course when a poet is seeking to earn and then maintain the patronage of a noble who is as prominent as Southampton was. So should we read this dedication as proof that William Shakespeare was seeking out a physical, sexual relationship with Henry Risley, Earl of Southampton? Is it evidence that Southampton was the fair youth? Do let me know what you think in the comments section down below. A close reading and perhaps even an attempt to decode Sonnet 20 gives us another potential candidate. Certain individuals have taken this line, a man in hue, all hues in his controlling, as evidence for this particular candidate. They claim that Miss WH and also the fair youth is one Willie Hughes or William Hughes. We get to the name Willie Hughes because in addition to the punning on Hugh that is found here in Sonnet 20, there is also a lot of punning on the word will throughout the rest of the sonnets. However, perhaps we shouldn't read too much into this because, of course, the sonnet's author is also a will. Could the continual punning on the name will that is found in the sonnet be more about the author than his subject? It is, however, unclear who Willie or William Hughes is, or if he ever existed. In later centuries, Oscar Wilde would claim that Willie Hughes was a beautiful boy player from Shakespeare's company, who was famed for being especially adept at making a convincing woman on the stage. Indeed, Oscar Wilde would create a fictionalised narrative of Willie Hughes and his life for his portrait of Miss WH, which was published in 1889. I have just talked about three of four candidates that I think potentially could have been the Fair Youth or Miss WH. In the three that I have just talked about, there is, I believe, the potential that in the relationship between author and subject, there is a romantic rather than a platonic love. That the author is either enjoying or hopes to enjoy the physical representation of that love, of homoerotic desire being expressed sexually and physically. In the case of the fourth candidate that I would like to suggest, this is not what's going on, or at least I certainly hope it's not what's going on, because the fourth candidate is William Hart. He's born in 1600 to William Shakespeare's sister, Joan. So it's his nephew. After the death of William Shakespeare's son, Hamnet, in 1596, is it possible that his nephew, William Hart, became both surrogate son and also male heir? In seeking to inspire him to go forth and multiply in the procreation sonnets, does this make sense? That he wishes to see and ensure that his nephew will have children, as his own son would not be able to. As lovely as this story of platonic and pseudo-paternal love going from bereaved father William Shakespeare to his replacement son and nephew William Hart may be, 
I think it's important to remember that William Hart is not the person that inherits from William Shakespeare. Instead, the bulk of William Shakespeare's vast estate goes to his daughter, Susanna, and her husband, Dr. Hall. And William Hart is certainly still alive when Shakespeare dies. He doesn't die until 1639. So he was available to inherit had Shakespeare's will specified it, but it doesn't. As is so often the case, I think that in attempting to read the fair youth through William Hart, it's actually people attempting to create a biography for William Shakespeare out of thin air. We know relatively little about the man. I think that some people are trying to knit together family relationships and friendships to make them stronger than potentially they actually were. But what do you think about that? Do let me know in the comments section down below. I'd also love to know whether you think that these fair youth sonnets are responding to platonic or homoerotic love. In 1640, evidently, Ben Jonson felt that it was the latter, that these poems were clearly homoerotic, because he edited the collection of Shakespeare sonnets to obscure the evident maleness of the fair youth. The changes that Ben Jonson made stayed in place in subsequent editions up to 1780. I've also suggested four potential candidates for the fair youth or Miss WH. Do any of them seem to be particularly stand out as options for you? Is there somebody that I've missed off that you think is a better candidate? And also please tell me what you think of this video in the comments section down below. Or come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave the links in the description box so you can follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon. Now those last two are gonna be particularly important as I'm putting part two of this discussion up next week. So make sure you are subscribed with notifications turned on so that YouTube alerts you when the next video goes up. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to seeing you all next Friday. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.